And today, as we move forward into the time of, of the sermon, we get this reading, Matthew 28, verse 19, and it's only going to be the first half is what we're going to focus on. And here's what Jesus says. Therefore, go and make disciples of all people, of all nations. I mean, the mission here, this is the crux. We're getting, we've been looking weeks at this, looking at the atmosphere of the mission and the attitudes we have to have of surrender and worship and, and obedience, all moving into this time where Jesus finally shares with us the, the great commission. And I've kind of shared with you the situation that stands before us. That we have this amazing opportunity to join Jesus in his mission as we focus on probably aspects of the mission that, that we have not really had to put a major emphasis on recently. And especially in the recent past, we haven't had to do so. But like the early church, we're stepping into whole new territory. Like the scripture uh, that Catherine read that Jesus said, man, the fields are ripe for harvest. Pray to God that he'll send people out to make this thing happen. But we have to be honest about how rapid the marginalization of the church in Western society has taken us by surprise, and it really has. Um, I, sometimes I see pastors' meetings and, and bishops and all the district superintendents, and they almost have a deer in headlights look. It's like, holy cow, just in the past decade, man, it's just like, whoosh, it's just happened. And, and we know because there's like 7,000 churches annually that close in America. Man, that's a lot every day, every single day, a lot. 100 or 1,500 pastors leave ministry monthly. 50% of millennials and Generation X have never attended a church service. That's 60 plus million people. The fields are ripe for harvest. Pray to the Lord that he'll send workers. But I don't see this as panic mode when I look at this. And I certainly don't see this as, as pessimism because I truly believe this is our opportunity, a chance to join Jesus in his mission again and, and, and just do amazing things with God in mission. The chance to continue our faithfulness as we step into what I would call a whole new era of, of mission and ministry in America. And it has to be a whole new era because the old era is gone. It's the mission of making disciples of Jesus for the transformation of lives so that in turn we can make a transformation within this world. And I could give you all kinds of stats. I did a 50 years a study of the past 50 years of the United Methodist Church and other um, mainline churches just this past week. And, oh, man, it's not pretty. It's not. We, we see a, a complete decline. But to stand up here and throw these horrible stats out doesn't really change anything. And, and for the most part, when you throw these negative things out, it doesn't spark revival in your heart, does it? It doesn't get you all excited. Woo-hoo, yeah, this is great, and it interests you. It just makes you feel like that person who goes to the, the football game and your team is 0-15, so you have to wear the bag over your head, you know what I'm saying, when you're out there, because it's like you're just almost embarrassed to be there, like, oh, my gosh. And that's sometimes how we feel, I think. But these stats do help us. Be aware of and understand our culture's changing landscape. And we have to be aware of this. And not only just cognitively in our head we understand it, but it has to move to our hearts where we are changed and we truly believe something has to change. And then it moves to our hands where we actually make that change. So it's about the head, the heart, and the hands always of where we're going. Now, in the recent past, I just shared this not long ago. In the recent past, church... Uh, Church um, attendance was just understood within our culture. I mean, you just went to church on Sunday. That's how it was. And, and if you're as old as I am, you younger ones, you won't believe this, but when you got up on Sunday, you couldn't get a gallon of milk or a gallon of gasoline because nothing was open on a Sunday. Nothing. That's just the way it was because the culture said Church is where it was supposed to be. So it's logical that when all the people were coming to church, I mean, you didn't have to do anything to try and go out and reach people. Hey, what we need to focus on is maintenance here. We need to focus on, on, on how we're teaching people, how we're working within this congregation of all these people being here. But guess what? There is no cultural expectation of church attendance today. Did you know that? <laughs> None whatsoever. None. So the church, in order to thrive today, is going to have to have, I think, a new emphasis. And the new emphasis in this mission is going to have to be on going and on reaching out and on trying to help people and find people. It's going to be a culture of invitation, and it's a culture of truly loving people and wanting what's best for them. 
See, it's not so much about church growth. I think it's about church health. See, a good, healthy church is focused upward on God. It's focused inward to help people grow as, as disciples, and it's focused outward to help bring people in. And when you can get these three together, you're moving and things are happening. It's an emphasis of a, a, a balance of emph emphasis. So let's get into this because this is going to be this is going to be a long thing. Okay, everybody ready? Shake it off. Let's get it going. Here we go. The original language, this is what we find out, what Jesus tells us right here. There is one commandment that is given. There is one imperative that is given. There is one main thing that we are called to do, and Jesus says, make disciples. This is your one thing. This is the one thing the church is about. This is what I'm calling you to do. There's nothing else. This is the imperative, the command to do. Now, surrounding the imperative, we're going to see in the next three weeks, there are three participles that are all dependent upon the main clause, and we call them ing words as going, as baptizing, and as teaching. And those hell are powerful words, and they're going to fit right into this. But all those things lead to one thing, making disciples. The very essence of why the church exists. And everything that we do either helps that or hinders that. You see, being and making disciples is the one true stat that defines a church's success. I want you to hear this. Um, it's not about your financial status in the church. It's not about the building status. It's not about all the programs you run. It's not even about attendance numbers. These things can all, I guess you would say... Um, are possible indicators of what is good or bad or happening. But the one thing that defines success in church is making disciples. That's what Jesus tells us. So if making disciples is a key thing, we better find out what a definition of a disciple is. What's the profile of a disciple? What does that mean, literally? Literally, the word means to be a learner, a follower, or a convert, one who adheres to the teachings and doctrines of another and then assists in the spreading of that teaching. It was the same thing in Judaism. They studied, they learned, there was instruction, there was practical experience. In fact, most disciples changed their lives from an old life to a new life because they left an old life to start a new life as they followed this teacher and they connected with this teacher and, and they helped and they served the teacher. They sat under the teacher's authority. In fact, not only did they get this kind of training where they learned head knowledge, but they learned to become like the teacher in character and nature and lifestyle and in practice. That's why Jesus says things like Luke 6, 40, a disciple is not above his teachers, but everyone who is perfectly trained will be like their teacher, just like them in every aspect. We have to remember. Matthew 19 Discipleship is about commitment. And this is where it's going to start getting heavy, okay? Matthew 19, 27, a rich man comes, a rich young man comes to Jesus, says, Jesus, tell me what life's about. Show me what life's about. Very interesting because this man had, had wealth, he had power, he had everything. He looked like he had it all together. Everything was perfect for him. And he comes to Jesus and says, there's still a big hole right here. Where, where do I find life? I mean, really find life. And Jesus says, what you do is all these things that are, that are holding you back. Jesus says, all these commitments in your life, that, that they just hold you. Let all those things go. In fact, sell everything you have. Give it away to the poor and then commit yourself fully to me and come and follow me. And you will have life and the life that you've been searching for. And what happens in the story? Uh, he walks away sad. Why? He couldn't commit himself fully to follow Jesus. You see, discipleship is about a full commitment to follow Jesus. Oh, it looks good, Jesus. It sounds good, but I can't commit my life to that. In fact, it, the New Testament is full of stories of people who wanted to follow Jesus, but they wanted to be a disciple of Jesus on their own terms. I'll be a disciple of, of yours, Jesus, as long as I don't have to change or change my lifestyle or anything like that. As long as I can believe whatever I want to believe and do whatever I want to do. As long as you don't have such a big commitment. As long as I can just surrender myself as minimally as possible to you, Jesus. As long as I just you know, don't have to make such a, a large commitment to you, I, I'll, I'll be your disciple. And every time Jesus said, it mm, doesn't work that way. No more this young man leaves sad and, and the disciples begin to talk to Jesus. Say, Jesus, we left 
everything for you. Jesus says, yeah, I know. You see, this is the commitment. You've committed so much to me right here. This is the thing. And I guarantee you, whatever you've let go in those other commitments, you will be blessed a hundred times fold as you step into the kingdom. You see, this is what it's about. When we commit ourselves fully to Jesus, things happen. I've got a question for you today. Would you be willing to take the next step to more deeply commit your life to being a disciple of Jesus no matter where it takes you, no matter what it costs you? Would you do that? It's heavy. But that's the commitment. Or maybe it's like Paul, 1 Corinthians 11.1. 1. Paul says, just follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. In other words, what he's saying is pattern your life after me because I've patterned my life after Christ. And if you pattern your life after me, it's just like you're following Jesus. Ooh, that's pretty heavy, isn't it? How would you like this? I come and I say, you know, I've just found this new convert. He doesn't know anything about Jesus, but he loves Jesus. He wants to follow him. So what they're going to do is they're going to follow you for the next six months, everywhere, day, night, no matter where you go, no matter what you do, they're going to follow you. And they're going to learn exactly what it is to be a disciple of Jesus because you're going to model Jesus in every aspect for him. Who wants the job? Yeah. Not too many of us want to raise our hands, do we? Boom. Boom. You mean they're going to follow me into the, the computer room at night when I look things I probably shouldn't be looking at? They're going to follow me to work when I, when I, when I lie or cheat there and try and get ahead? They're going to follow me. Oh, man, I'm not sure. I, oh, right? See, the first step of discipling, Remember, Jesus said, make disciples. The first step of discipling is first being a disciple yourself. I cannot disciple somebody else if I am not first a disciple. You can't get away from that. <laughs> that means I have to be ever learning, ever growing, ever moving closer to Jesus, ever becoming more like Jesus, ever modeling Jesus' lifestyle, his character, his nature, his practice, because Jesus poured his life into 12 persons so that they could be disciples, so that they could in turn 12, pour their lives into people and help them become disciples, and pretty soon it changes the world. Okay, I think, I think we're all going to get this, but... Peter Drucker the guru of organizations. He's a guru of just kind of organizational thinking, whether it's a business or a church or whatever the organization is. He has this saying that, it, at first I didn't get it, but then once I got it, it was powerful. Here's what he says. He says, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Everybody, everybody's like, okay, preacher, you finally lost it. I know. Culture eats strategy for breakfast. You see, the culture of the organization, business, church, whatever it is, the culture is the shared norms, the shared values we have, the shared behavior we carry out of the organization. That culture, no matter how it is, he says, will, will chew up and, and eat up and be much more powerful than any strategy you can throw out there to make change that takes place. Does that make sense now that I say that? Far too often, a business, a church, whatever it is, we see a need. Oh, my gosh. We're in panic mode. Uh, the church is shrinking. We don't know what to do. Man, let's just take strategy. Here's 50 strategies. We're going to throw them all against the wall and see if one of them sticks, and we're going to start trying to do it, right? Isn't that how we think? Man, we're, we're in panic mode. We've got to make this thing happen. You know what Peter Drucker tells us? Here's the first thing every time. The first thing you've got to do is look at the culture of the organization. Because that's going to tell you exactly how they're functioning, if there needs to be change, necessary change, and how to bring renewal into that thing. And until the organizational culture changes, it doesn't matter what strategy you throw out there, it's not going to change a thing. Jesus could come here and say, here's your strategy, here's three things, you do these three things, I guarantee you, man, this is going to be the biggest church in the whole country. And, and, but if our culture isn't at the place it needs to be, those strategies are useless, meaningless, because it's all about the culture. He 
Here's my questions for you, and I want you to be thinking about these. Where is our church culture when it comes to these next two things? See, Jesus gave a great strategy and mission, but he also created this wonderful culture to carry out the mission. And he helped them see it's a culture of love and a culture of invitation. And I want you, between those two things, a culture of love and a culture of invitation, begin to think about my life, begin to think about our church, and what's the culture here that we see? See, here's where it begins. Man, we have got to have a deep concern and love for people. I mean, for souls, eternal souls. We have to have a love over programs. We have to have a love over buildings. We have to have a love over our traditions for people. See, Jesus had quite a love for people. People always took priority. Jesus did not come, become a person, and die on a cross to save an institution. He didn't do it to save programs or material things or traditions, but he came to save people, people who were souls created in the image of God, created by God, created for God, created to be in relationship with God, but the curse of sin is now brought, is marred it, and it's brought this separation. And Jesus says, I've come back for people because I love them. And I'm going to die on a cross for them. That's the kind of love that I have. See, without a deep love for people, the mission is going to go nowhere. And when I talk about love, it's not because I know I throw it out there. Do you love people? And everybody goes, oh, we love people. We do. We really, really do. And we say that so that we don't have to individually love anybody. You know, it's just like, oh, yeah, you just keep them at arm's length. We love everybody in the world. Just don't come close to us. You know, that's not, you know, that's not the reality. I'm talking about love people. With all that we have. Here's a definition, a biblical definition of love. To have a concern for another, to seek what is best for the other, and to act on their behalf. To love people. See, here's what our teacher said, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, he had more than a more mushy feeling for it, but he sent his son to die for it so that those who believed in him would have everlasting life and not perish. Matthew 9, what's Jesus? He's just walking along. He's doing out ministry, talking to people, helping people, healing people, doing everything that he can. And he just looks up and he sees all those persons out there. And he, his heart breaks and he says he has compassion for them. Because he looked down and he says, they're just so lost and, and they're, they don't know where to go. They're like a sheep without a shepherd. Pray to God that he'll send people out there to go minister to them. That's the kind of love he had. Luke 19, 10, where Jesus said, I have come, the Son of Man, to seek and to save that which is lost. That's what I'm here for. That's the kind of love that I have. You see, in our world, there is brokenness, there is loneliness, there is pain, there's addictions, and people are searching. People are searching for wholeness and peace and rest and truth and meaning and just life. They're like that rich young man saying, I know I've got all this stuff, but man, I don't have life. There's something missing. Show me what it is. And the problem is, as they've been looking for these things, their search has led them to live for pleasure and for materialism, for recreation, for sex, for drugs, for all these other things that leave them lost and spiritually separated from God. If that's you today, man, I'm saying come to Jesus because <laughs> he's going to give you life. Jesus had such a love for people. He was moved to act for him. He literally came here and died on a cross for them, pouring out his life. He gave everything, his blood, his sweat, his tears, his very last breath. Are we ready to be a people who love? And when I mean love, I'm talking about pour out our lives, focus on others, meet their needs, reach out to them, share more than we have ever done before in our lives with people. A new emphasis. Would you pray with me? <laughs> Lord, forgive us for not having the same love for people that you have. And give us a burning love and passion for those who need to know you. And help us connect to you. And help us connect to them. Amen. How's love? How's the culture of love here? How's the culture of love in our hearts? Number two, do you remember what it's like to be without Jesus? 
Do you remember what it's like to be without hope, without peace, without meaning, without new life that Jesus gives us? Has Jesus made a difference in your life at all? Has he made it better? Then how could we not invite people to know Jesus and share Jesus with them? It's about a culture of invitation. Sharing is so natural for us, is it not? You go to a new restaurant and the food's good. What's the first thing you do? Oh, you got to go see this restaurant. It's so good, man. I, come on, let's go eat there. You got to share it, right? There's this new show on. It's so awesome. You got to watch this show. It's on Netflix. You got to get, right? How about Jesus in your life? Hmm. Really? Invite, share. We have the most important person, the most important message, and the most important truth in the world. Could we begin to share it in a new and more opportune way in our lives? It reminds me of John 4. See, Jesus meets this woman at the well. Her life's a mess. That's okay. Because when she comes to Jesus and they're talking, and Jesus says, I'll give you living water. I'll give you the life you've been looking for. I'm going to take care of you. And, and she realizes, man, you're the Messiah. You're the Christ. And she's so taken away. She goes back to her village. And what does it say in the Bible? She goes back to her village, and then she says, well, she just kind of sat at home and was quiet. And, mm, mm. She went back to the village. She told everybody, you've got to come meet this Jesus. I met him. He changed my life. He's going to change your life. Come on, let's go meet him. And the whole town comes out. That's what it's like. And they go out there and they meet Jesus, and Jesus touches their lives. And they say, we believe not because you told us now, but because Jesus has touched my life. Isn't that the most amazing? Isn't that so simple? Or maybe uh, Andrew in, in John chapter 1. Remember Andrew. Uh, he's been following John the Baptist, and John the Baptist one day points at Jesus and says, look, the Lamb of God who's going to take away the sin of the world, you need to follow him. And he starts to follow him, and he realizes this is the Messiah, the Christ. And he turns and he runs, and he goes right to his brother Peter and says, I met the Messiah. He's changed my life. you got to come meet him. And he does, and look what's happened in the world because of it, because we shared it. We invited people to know Jesus. Man, I'm telling you, it doesn't work so well to look at somebody and go, your life's a mess. You got problems. Oh, you need to change. It's so much better to look at someone and say, look what Jesus has done in my life. I think he could do it for you. Come meet him. It's a culture of invitation. You know what's so easy? You know what's the best part? All you have to do is invite people to come to church. You don't even have to talk about Jesus. Guess who talks about Jesus every single day is up here? That's all you have. A culture of invitation is it? come find Jesus. He's going to change your life. But you see, until a church has a culture of pure love for people over everything else and a culture of invitation and sharing, saying, I can't wait to share Jesus with the world. It doesn't matter what strategy somebody throws up here. Well, let's start doing some of these things. Maybe people will come. No, they're going to come because you love them and because you invite them to be here. That's it. How's our culture right here? Lord, help us. <laughs> Help us to love you so completely that we'll commit ourselves to you again in a new way to grow in our discipleship. Lord, give us a deep concern and love for people. I'm talking all people. Lord, give us a passion to share you and invite people to know you. And I'm telling you today, folks, you have permission to go, to love, to share, and to serve.